really enjoy that guitar playing and that harmony. I'll tell you what, I love that. It's just outstanding. Beautiful. I could listen all day. Can you guys do the same? Yes, yeah, Terry, you do a great job. Sometimes I wonder if you're going to make it, but you always do. You always get on your toes when you make it. You make that high note. Man. It's exciting. Well, everybody looks so good today. I can tell, tell you neighbors are looking good. Still somebody. That's right. Oh, somebody is looking good today. The house of the Lord. Yes. Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. We are gathered here on Palm Sunday here to celebrate the love of our Savior. Yes. We're going to be talking about Christ and the cross. A man's last and only hope. It's true. I think all of us who've experienced that, we, we, we come to know that it's the Christ of the cross that made the difference in our lives. Maybe we got everybody handed out. And if you need an extra copy to give to someone, maybe your neighbor or friend or family member, we try to make a few extras so you can do that. So feel free at the end of the service if you want another copy to share with someone. That would be a wonderful gesture for you to do that. I've already ministered this message to a group of ministers in Dunn Friday. We had a bunch of ministers that meet. There's about 40 of us there last Friday. And I shared this message a little bit with them for several different reasons. So I'm excited to be here today to do it again. The scripture speaks in Luke 23. Two other criminals were led out to be executed with him at a place called the Skull. Something like a nightclub, doesn't it? Something weird. The Skull. There, all three were crucified. Jesus on the center cross and two criminals on either side. Father, thank you for this message that you put in my heart to put together for today. Speak to us all and to me especially for we all need to hear this word. And we thank you for, for your wonderful presence of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for everyone that's here today. Let us all be blessed by your everlasting word and by your wonderful spirit who's with us in Christ's name. And everybody said amen. amen. This account is a story of a sin-soaked criminal received by a blood-stained Savior. And all of us have been there. We've experienced what we're talking about today. Who would have been Christ's most remarkable convert? Who would have been Christ's most remarkable convert? That's a good question we're going to talk a little bit about. I think about the people in my life and ministry that came to Christ because I was able to maybe witness or preach a message. And I think over the years, different ones that the Lord helped me. I remember one in Pinehurst. I went to a the, the, the Pinehurst Deli and gave a testimony to the server, a lady, a real nice lady who was serving. And she seemed very interested in what I shared about Christ. I went there the next week and took her a Bible. That young lady still serving the Lord. She was young then too. She was very young. There's just we, the experiences we have where people come to know Christ because of our 
kindness or because of sharing something with them. But who would have been Christ's most remarkable convert? What about among the rich? Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph is mentioned in all four Gospels, Joseph of Arimathea. He was a wealthy man, we understand. Some people call him sort of a secret follower of Christ. Uh, he asked for Jesus' body, went to Pilate, which took some courage, went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body after the crucifixion, put him in his own tomb. That was He had his own tomb. He put Christ there. He was, the Bible says he was a just man. He was waiting for the kingdom of God. And um, he was a member of the Sanhedrin council. But he was opposed to the crucifixion of Christ. So Joseph of Arimathea was an interesting person uh, among the more elite people. When I first moved to uh, Pinehurst and started the church there, you can't believe how many uh, cocktail parties I went to. And I was going to a cocktail party on a regular basis. I drunk so much orange juice, I, I, I'm, that's why I'm still living today, probably. <laughs> I drunk a lot of orange juice, buddy. And I mingled among some of these people that are the uh, blue bloods, they call them, of, of the community. And I was able to lead some of them to Christ and their families to Christ because of that encounter. Among the religious would have been the convert Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a rabbi. He was, he was an impressive rabbi. He was a member of the Jewish ruling council, the Supreme Court of the Sanhedrin. He was something. And he came to Christ, and he was very tactful. He said, you're such a great teacher, Jesus. Jesus took the conversation and moved it around and changed the conversation. And that's where we have the story where Jesus, for the first time, says to Nicodemus, the, the rabbi, you must be born again. Born again? How can I re-enter my mother's womb? Because you know the spiritual application that he explained to Nicodemus. Among the religious, it must maybe we could be Nicodemus. What about among the rejected people? Who was maybe the greatest convert Christ had? And some would say the woman at the well was quite unique. He goes to the Jacob's well, and there she is, and and he asks for water and and think the whole conversation and, and then come to find out Jesus exposed her and told her that she had five husbands the one she was with was another one and so she runs into town and says come see this man who told me everything about myself and what a great convert what a great conversation that led to that convert among the rejected because she was there alone because she didn't come with the other women because of her reputation. She'd come alone. And what about among the uh, fishermen? Uh, Peter and he, I call it Peter and the crew, and all the fishermen that uh, were converts. What about Matthew, a tax collector? When you watch The Chosen, you really get a real sense of what it must have been like with Matthew, he's a very interesting character in the chosen, very interesting that they chose to portray. But then, who could have been the most interesting or remarkable convert? What about the conversion of the dying thief? I kind of think that uh, he may be among the most remarkable and the most interesting story of the dying thief on the cross. He had never been to church that we know of, never been to a synagogue, most likely. 
Somebody did a wonderful rendition of what it may be like when he come to the door of heaven, paradise. Peter may have said to him, oh, hey, did you get here because of the four laws? Roman road? Did you get here because you understood all about justification by faith? Did you get here because you understood the mystery of the incarnation of Christ? Is that how you got here? He said, no, I don't know about any of that. That man on the middle of the cross said, I could come. That's the only thing I can say. He said, I could come. Man. Remarkable conversion. In Luke 23, 35 through 43, Max Lucado describes in his book, Six Hours on One Friday, he describes the scene of the thief and the conversation that took place. The thief says to the other thief, don't you even fear God when you are dying? He says to the other thief, we deserve to die for our deeds, but this man has not done anything wrong. For that in effect is exactly what the criminal is doing. He is stumbling his way to safety just as the gate to heaven is closing. He stumbles his way to heaven. Lodged in the thief statement are two facts that anyone needs to recognize when they come to Christ. We're getting what we deserve. He said, we're getting what we deserve. This man has done nothing wrong. We're guilty, but he's innocent. We're filthy, but he's pure. He's not on the cross for our sins. He's, he's on the cross for our sins, not for his sins, he says. At once, this man understood understood this. His request seemed only natural. And Max Licato says, as he looked into the eyes of his last hope, he made the same request that any other Christian has made. Remember me when you come into the kingdom. At this point, Jesus performs the greatest miracle at the cross. He performs the miracle of forgiveness. And again, I like that phrase, a sin-soaked criminal is received by his blood-stained Savior. And Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. This is a solemn promise and he goes on to describe it. Wow! Only seconds before, the thief was a beggar, nervously squeezing his hat at the door of the castle and asking the king if he could spare a little crumb. But in a moment in time, he's not getting just a crumb. He's getting the whole pantry. And Max Lucado says, this is the definition of grace. He asks for a crumb, and God gives him the paradise and everything in it. Now, Brent Manning, a Catholic priest, has written two books that have been very transformative to my life. One was about the tenderness of Jesus, and the next one was the ragamuffin gospel about grace. Both two, two books that were very, very transformative, very amazing books. Brennan Manning. He explains it this way. He said, we go and get in line to the back door of heaven because God is handing out amazing grace. And we get in line squeezing our little hat, bowing our little heads, and we're standing in line with all the common people, with all the rich people, with all the poor people, with everybody. We're just like standing in line at the back door of heaven with our hat in one hand 
and our hand reached out in the other and saying, okay, God, I will receive amazing grace because I need you so much. As Terry was talking about that song, I need everything you have and especially your amazing grace. That's how Brendan Manning described it. Waiting in line for the handout. Oh, I don't, I don't believe it. I don't take handouts. Uh, no, no I, I, I'm not a person that likes handouts. I'm going to tell you, when it comes to grace, when it comes to the love of God, I'm afraid you've got to become a handout person. You've got to get in line with all the other people and you've got to extend your hand and open your palm and say, Father in heaven, give me the grace of salvation because I'm standing here and I desperately need it. That's how Brendan Manning describes it. It's hard to understand how two people can see the same, hear the same words and see the same Savior and yet come away with a different result. One sees hope and the other sees nothing but himself. One is dying in sin. One is dying to sin. And one is dying for sin. How many are glad that Christ died for our sins? Two were paying your debt to society. One was paying our debt for our sins. One thief joined with the crown, with the crowd in mockery of Christ. He became especially bitter as he, as he spoke. One thief tunes out. One thief tunes out the voice of God, but the other thief listens. One thief tunes out the cry of conscience, but the other responds. We need to ask this question of ourselves today. Do people see bitterness in us? Do people see negativity in our lives? Do people see us as people who listen to the voice of God? God does speak. God still speaks today. Sometimes he speaks in an audible voice. That's kind of rare, I have to say. If God speaks to you in an audible voice, it's a little rare, but it does happen. Yes, I know people that heard the voice of God audibly, but that's kind of rare. But he also speaks in dreams and visions, sometimes. He also speaks through people, sometimes. Sometimes he speaks through circumstances of our life. Sometimes. But he speaks all the time through his word. All the time. You can open up the word of God, any page, open anywhere the word of God, and God will speak to you from his word all the time. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice, and they follow me. Do you listen to the voice of God in your spirit, in your heart? It's very important that we ask those questions of ourselves. Now, I'm going to tell you about another situation that was a part of my family, a part of my life, because I was born in Augusta, Georgia, by Yankee parents. Yeah, Northern parents. <coughs> had a southern-born boy, David, named after David in the Bible. Now, before I tell you this incredible event, uh, I, I have the utmost respect for law enforcement. I really do. And whenever I have had opportunities to be among law enforcement people, I give them respect that I believe that most of them, if not all of them, except for maybe a very few percentage, deserve. But 99%, I have great honor and respect for law enforcement. But there was a situation in my childhood when I was born in Augusta. My father was a pastor who started the Assemblies of God Church there in Augusta, Georgia. 
And an incident took place that was written up across magazines across the nation. News reports went across the nation. My father had started the church and they were having revivals to get the church established. And it was remarkable crowds coming to the revival. Police, three police officers came in to the service and told my father he had to stop the people in the altar from praying because they were a little too loud. And he had to close down the service. And my father said, I can't do that. People were in the altar and they were crying out to God, pouring their souls out to God. And the police officer said, you're going to have to stop this service and you're going to have to stop these people praying. My father said, I can't do that. Well, w Wayne Holly said, well, if you won't do it, I'll do it. And a woman nearby heard him say that. And she said to the Wade Holly, one of the officers, Sir, I will tell you this. Before I would do what you're thinking about doing, I would turn my uniform in and I would quit my job before I do what you're thinking about doing. But Wade Holly said to her, I'm not afraid of God, I'm not afraid of the devil, and I'm not afraid of anyone here. And he went down to the altar, began to jerk people out of the altar, told them to shut up and get up out of that altar. He was closing the service down because it was too noisy at night. But right down two blocks down the road, there was a ball field. And they would play ball after midnight and hoop and holler. But they didn't like the noise that they were making and praying out to God or singing or whatever. So Wade Holly told the woman she wasn't afraid of God or the, or the devil. You know, I thought about that this morning as I was going to do it, going to do this message. I think we have too many politicians in Washington who are not afraid of God anymore. They have no reverence for God at all. We don't need politicians. We need leaders who reverence God Amen. is what we need today. Amen. Not politicians who have no fear of God. So Wade Holly goes down to the altar and begins to jerk people up off of the kneeling and tell them, shut up. We're closing the service down and closed down the service, little by little, one by one, pulling people out of the altar. And the altars were full of people praying. So the, the service ended with that incident that took place. They eventually won out in court, and my father was acquitted for and being arrested for making noise. He was acquitted by a Jewish man who said, if I could believe that Jesus was the Messiah, I would run up and down these streets of Augusta in my robes and scream into the housetop, case dismissed. So the revival continued, and a great church was established, and is still there today. But the story is not over yet. Two of the officers died very violent death within about 90 days after the experience. Wade Holly, who said he wasn't afraid of God or the devil, shot a man and, and murdered a man off duty, went to trial, and was sentenced to death by the electric chair. My father, even though he was a pastor, had real love for people who had made wrong choices, who were in jail or prison, so he would go on a regular basis to prisons and jails to do ministry along with the church he pastored because he had such a deep, profound love for people who had made wrong choices. And Wade Holly had heard that he was doing ministry in prison. So Wade Holly sent a message while he was in prison waiting execution for my father to come and see him. My father went to see Wade, the former police officer, 
And Wayne Holly looked at the face of my father and said, Reverend Hicks, I can't believe I did what I did in your church. I can't believe I did what I did killing a man, but he said, I just can't believe I did what I did to the people who were praying. And my father led him to Christ. Talk about conversions. It was, a, it was not a typical jailhouse conversion. Sometimes we look at conversions that take place in jail or prison, and we kind of call it, we, we sort of have a wonder, well, maybe it's just a jailhouse type conversion. But his conversion was dramatic. It was remarkable how changed a man he became overnight after being born again. It was remarkable. Even the warden came to my father and said, I can't believe the difference that man is. How different he is after being born again of Christ. So he helped my father and they went to the governor trying to get his sentence reduced to life imprisonment instead of the electric chair, but to no avail. The governor wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't make that uh, possible. And so the church knew that Wade Holly was facing the electric chair. And the church began to pray that he wouldn't have to die that way because he had been so dramatically saved and his life was so different the days he was in the prison after his conversion. And my father got a call on Easter Sunday morning from the prison. A few days before he was set in the electric chair, on Easter Sunday morning, the Lord took him home. He died in the early morning hours to be with the Lord in his sleep. And they called my father. He had already had put in his wheel that my father was to preach his funeral. And so they brought Wade Holly to the First Assembly of God Church and brought his casket in and put it right in the altar where he had pulled people out of the altar. That's where he laid in the casket. The crowd outside the church was as large as the crowd inside the church. And it was such a remarkable story, the Associated Press came and was there for the meeting and for the funeral. It was a remarkable story of our experience of my childhood and of my father. And my father has already met Wade Holly on the other side. Full circle. He comes to my father's church, stops the service, jerks people out of the altar, commits a horrible crime, goes to prison, gets saved, and now he's with my father in heaven. What a story. You know, sometimes I have some bad, bad attitudes. I look at people, I look at that precious nurse in Georgia, Athens, I think it was, nursing student who was killed by the illegal from Venezuela. And I look, she was going to be a, a blessing to humanity. She was going to nurse people. She was close to graduating. And this guy that brutally murdered her was no blessing to society at all. He's nothing but a curse. And she represented a life of, of service and blessing. He represented nothing. Nothing good. And I, I look at that and I say, God, that's hard to reconcile in your mind. A person whose life has seemed to be worthless, taking the life of someone who could contribute so much. Her mother said she loved the Lord. So, she's in heaven now. But what about the person that took the life of someone who would serve humanity? Now, I owe a 
don't look at him as worthless. Piece of nothing. That's the way I want to look at it that way. Compared to the beauty of that beautiful girl. But the truth is, as hard as I have attitudes that way, Jesus died for the worst of the worst of us. I don't like it thinking that sometimes. Because I don't like that person, what he did. But Jesus died on the cross for sinners. And maybe we're not as bad as that man from Venezuela. But the Bible says he looked upon all of us as sinners lost without God. Aren't you glad that one day you got in line with all kinds of people Different people, some of them little crazy people, but you got in line and opened up your palm and said, Lord, I'll take everlasting life. I will receive your amazing grace because I so desperately need you, Terry. Every hour I need you. Amen. And Jesus said to Wade Holly, and he said to the thief, Today you will be with me in paradise. Wow. Jesus, thank you. Join us do the old rugged cross. Let's stand together. We're going to sing the verses first and then the chorus for last. But look at the words, if you would.
that you died for sinners like us. Paul said he was the worst of sinners. The worst. Father, we thank you. As we partake of communion this morning, we give our hearts to you afresh and anew. We ask you to come into our lives and come into our hearts and cleanse us and make us what we need to be by your mighty power. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you. We thank you for your wonder and for your beauty and for the wonder of the cross. We thank you that you poured out your amazing grace on people who didn't deserve it. That's us. But we marvel in it and we rejoice in it and we give you thanks for your amazing grace. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you would be seated for a few moments, we're going to serve you communion. Uh, George, would you help him? Ed, would you come and help with communion? which is broken for you. And then he picked up the cup and said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For he said, for often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes.
George, while you're up here, would you uh, give a prayer for the sacraments that we're about to receive? I saw a sign one time, an advertisement by the, I think it was the Episcopal Church, I believe it was, had put this ad out, and he saw a mom and dad and a little child, and the caption was so real, and it said, now that you've told your children about Disneyland, Disney World, don't you think it's time to talk to them about heaven? That was cool. I love that. These things of this world are passing away, but the things that are eternal are the things that we need to focus on and tell our children about and tell our families about. Wow. Listen, we're, we got something great at the close. We, we got a celebration going on today. We got a wonderful celebration in that first room on the left because there are some gifts there for a mother who's going to be bringing forth a beautiful baby. And we won't say who she is, I mean. But we're excited about that. And uh, this is an important day that we can share our kindness and our love to, to that baby that's on the way that my, my wife got so excited about doing the shopping. I was more worried about that. I don't know if she's interested in having more babies or not, but I don't think so. Well, I don't think that's gonna work too good. But anyway, she gets excited about other people's babies. So stay around a little bit, walk down that aisle, because we have the first door on the left. We've got some celebrating to do. God love you and God bless all of you today. And share this sermon with somebody. Take an extra copy and share it with somebody. Oh, okay. Well, it's coming in. It's coming here. My gracious. It's coming on a cart. It don't get no better than this. So, Ali and Chris, if you guys could come and over here, we're just going to pray for you guys, if that's okay. <laughs> and if you guys could just either stand and point your hands in their direction or gather around them. I'm okay with that. I don't think you guys are okay with that. Dear Lord God, we just thank you for Aaliyah and Chris. Yes, yes. And we thank you, Lord, for their lives. And we thank you, Lord, for your hand of blessing upon them. Yes. For your, yes. your yes. ways toward them are just loving and kind. And we know what great yes. love that you have for them, Lord. And let our yes. gifts to them just be a, a small extension of the love that you have for them, Lord. Yes. And I pray, Lord, that this baby that's growing in Aaliyah, Lord, that you would give her an easy delivery. Yes. Yes, yes. That you would yes. just bless them both yes. physically, bless them financially, and yes. most of all, Lord God, bless them spiritually. And let them know how much they are loved by you and by us, Lord, as a church family, Lord. And let them know that they are always welcome here. 
and that your plans for them are for good always. And so I just ask and yes. pray that you would bless them. Yes. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. 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 Just if you want me to push it out to the car, or you want to, you can push it in or however, whatever, or whatever. <laughs>